I'd noticed, well I would, that parking restrictions only applied between the hours of ten and midday, probably to discourage commuters from driving this far into town, dumping their cars for the day and carrying on in by tube. So I decided to take my car this time, a VW Polo, whose tyres would last a lot longer than Veronica's. After a purgatorial hour or so on the North Circular, I found myself in position, parked where we had been before, facing up the slight incline of a suburban street with the late afternoon sun catching the dust on a privet hedge. Bands of schoolchildren were on their way home, boys with shirts hanging out of their trousers, girls with provocatively high skirts, many on mobile phones, some eating, a few smoking. When I'd been at school, we were told that as long as you were in the uniform, you had to behave in a way that reflected well on the institution. So no eating or drinking in the street, while anyone caught smoking would be beaten. Nor was fraternization with the opposite sex allowed. The girls' school linked to ours and quartered nearby used to let its pupils out fifteen minutes before the boys were freed, giving them time to get well clear of their predatory and priapic male counterparts. I sat there remembering all this, registering the differences without coming to any conclusions. I neither applauded nor disapproved. I was indifferent. I had suspended my right to thoughts and judgments. All I cared about was why I had been brought to this street a couple of weeks previously. So I sat with my window down and waited. After two hours or so, I gave up. I came back the next day, and the next without success. Then I drove to the street with the pub and the shop, and parked outside. I waited, went into the shop and bought a few things, waited some more, drove home. I had absolutely no sense of wasting my time. Rather, it was the opposite way round, that this was what my time was now for and in any case the shop turned out to be pretty useful. It was one of those places which spans the range from delicatessen to hardware store. Over this period I bought vegetables and dishwasher powder, sliced meats and loo paper. I used the cash machine and stocked up on booze. After the first few days they started calling me mate. I thought at one point of contacting the borough's social services department and asking if they had a care in the community home which sheltered a man all covered in badges, but doubted this would get me anywhere. I would balk at their first question, Why do you want to know? I didn't know why I wanted to know. But as I say, I had no sense of urgency. It was like not pressing on the brain to summon a memory. If I didn't press on, what, time, then something perhaps, even a solution, might come to the surface. And in due course I remembered words I'd overheard. No, Ken, no pub today, Friday night's pub night. So the following Friday I drove over and sat with a newspaper in the William the Fourth. It was one of those pubs gentrified by economic pressure. There was a food menu with char-grilled this and that, a telly quietly emitting the BBC news channel, and blackboards everywhere, one advertising the weekly quiz night, another the monthly book club, a third the upcoming TV sports fixtures, while a fourth bore an epigrammatic thought for the day, no doubt transcribed from some corporate book of wit and wisdom. I slowly drank halves while doing the crossword, but nobody came. The second Friday I thought, I may as well have my supper here, so ordered char-grilled hake with hand-cut chips and a large glass of chili and Sauvignon Blanc. It wasn't bad at all. Then, on the third Friday, just as I was forking my penny with gorgonzola and walnut sauce, in walked the lopsided man and the chap with the moustache. They took their seats familiarly at a table, whereupon the barman, clearly used to their requirements, brought each of them a half of bitter, which they proceeded to sip meditatively. They didn't look around, let alone speak, to make eye contact and in return no one took any notice of them. After about twenty minutes, a motherly black woman came in, went up to the bar, paid and gently escorted the two men away. I merely observed and waited. 
Time was on my side. Yes, it was. Songs do occasionally tell the truth. I now became a regular at the pub as well as the shop. I didn't join the book club or participate in quiz night, but regularly sat at a small table by the window and worked my way through the menu. What was I hoping for? Probably to get into conversation at some point with a young care worker I'd seen escorting the quintet that first afternoon, or even perhaps with the badge man, who seemed the most affable and approachable. I was patient without any sense of being so. I no longer counted the hours. And then, one early evening, I saw all five of them approaching, shepherded by the same woman. Somehow I wasn't even surprised. The two regulars came into the pub. The other three went into the shop with a minder. I got up, leaving my biro and newspaper on the table as signs that I would return. At the shop's entrance, I picked up a yellow basket and wandered slowly round. At the end of an aisle, the three of them were clustered in front of a choice of washing-up liquids, gravely debating which to buy. The space was narrow, and I said aloud, Excuse me, as I approached. The gangly fellow with glasses immediately pressed himself face inwards against shelves of kitchen stuff, and all three fell silent. As I passed... The badge man looked me in the face. Evening, I said, with a smile. He carried on looking, then bowed from the neck. I left it at that and returned to the pub. A few minutes later, the three of them joined the two drinkers. The care woman went to the bar and ordered. I was struck by the fact that while they'd been boisterous and childlike in the street, they were shy and whispering in the shop and pub. Soft drinks were carried across to the newcomers. I thought I heard the word birthday, but might have been mistaken. I decided that it was time to order food. My path to the bar would take me close by them. I had no actual plan. The three who had come in from the shop were still standing, and they turned slightly as I approached. I addressed a second cheery evening to the badge man, who responded as before. The gangly bloke was now in front of me, and as I was about to make my way past, I stopped and looked at him properly. He was about forty, just over six feet, with a pallid skin and thick lensed glasses. I could sense he was keen to turn his back again, but instead he did something unexpected. He took off his glasses and looked me full in the face. His eyes were brown and gentle. Almost without thinking, I said to him quietly, I'm a friend of Mary's. I watched as he first began to smile, then panic. He turned away, gave a muted whine, shuffled close to the Indian woman and took her hand. I carried on to the bar, put half a buttock on a stool and started examining the menu. A moment or two later, I became aware of the black carer beside me. I'm sorry, I said. I hope I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not sure, she replied. It's not good to startle him, especially now. I met him once before with Mary when she came over one afternoon. I'm a friend of hers. She looked at me as if trying to assess my motives and my truthfulness. Then you'll understand, she said quietly. Won't you? Yes. I do. And the thing was, I did. I didn't need to talk to the badge man or the male carer. Now 